we have various things in common. I also studied some linguistics, and uh, I, I also spent some time at McGill, where you were a postdoc. Well, Megan uh, got a PhD from UCLA, however, and is now working here at Utrecht, and she will, her title is already on the board, What Makes the Language a Human Language? Thank you. Okay. Right. <laughs> Thank you very much for being here, for having me. Um, so today I'm going to give you a, a little bit of a, a mathematical perspective on, uh, on human language, how, to, how, how human languages can be characterized using math. Yes, good, okay. So if you're not familiar with linguistics, uh, linguistics is the scientific study of human language as a natural phenomenon. So this means that we're not interested in, say, the kinds of grammatical rules that you might learn from your teacher, this kind of thing. We're interested in how uh, real human language arises, how it's learned, how it changes, uh, what it means to know a language. Um, and uh, native speakers are experts in their language, regardless of whether they've learned anything in school about their language at all. So your language, whatever this thing is, it, it lives in your brain. But we don't know why. We don't know how it got there. We don't even really know exactly how to characterize what it means to, to know your language. What, what, what does it mean? What, what do you know when you know a language? So the problem of uh, language acquisition is that um, when you're so small that you don't know that spaghetti isn't a hat, you are somehow learning your language. And it takes you just a few years to be basically perfect. Um, you can't reason about your language. Uh, you can't take instruction about your language. Uh, you can no you're never going to hear all infinity sentences of your language, because uh, languages are infinite. Um, and yet somehow, this baby here is learning her language, and she, she's going to get it, even though nobody knows what languages really are. So there's this innateness hypothesis, which is that somehow she's born ready for language. Or maybe she's even born kind of knowing it, but obviously she doesn't like already know Dutch or something like that. So if she's already kind of born knowing language, it must be on some, sort of some ab more abstract sense of what that grammar might be. So that's the notion of universal grammar. So some people hypothesize that babies are born with sort of part of their grammar already ready, already there, and they just kind of have to figure out some details in order to figure out what their language is. This is a pretty controversial hypothesis. It's a very strong statement, which is part of the fun of it. Um, it's tricky, though. So what is in UG? You know, when you try to answer this question, um, you know, how, how does she, how, even if you had an idea of what it was, he doesn't necessarily tell you how it's going to help this baby. And usually when you try to be get really specific about what might be in UG, it doesn't go very well. So um, sometimes people say, well, one thing is that all languages have some certain categories of words. That doesn't tend to be true. Um, this is a notion called from binding theory. One piece of it is that all languages have these re things called reflexive pronouns, words like herself, which can only occur in really specific contexts, which includes not at the start of the sentence. Uh, that doesn't work, because even in Scottish English you can say something like, uh, herself is attending the gala, which means uh, she's attending the gala and she's really important. So these really specific things don't work very well. Um, the idea that all languages have recursion is, is, is better. So this is something that, uh, that uh, Chomsky himself actually has been, he's one of the authors on the et al. spit here, uh, has sometimes proposed might be that all there is to UG. All there is to UG is that there's recursion in your grammar. Recursion basically means is a way of making infinite use of finite means. So you have some finite set of things and you end up with an infinite set of things. And in particular, we're thinking about things like the way that a phrase can appear inside the same kind of phrase that it is. So here's an example of one appearing inside the actual literal same phrase as it. So this idea is here, so somebody, uh, somebody said, made a joke that they lost their sign and put up a poster saying, please help me find my lost sign. And then, uh, uh, and, then uh, and they made a sign for it. And then they lost it. So someone made a poster saying, oh no, I lost my lost sign, my lost sign sign. And then they lost that one. And then they made a new poster that says, oh no, I lost my lost sign 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 sign. Um, so you know you can keep doing this forever, like it says on the meme. And you could describe it something like this with a with a recursive tree structure that says, look, if you have an oops, I keep doing that. If you have like an NP inside your NP, you can have an NP, 
and inside your end, this is a sort. If you have a noun phrase, inside your noun phrase, you can have a noun phrase, and inside your noun phrase, you can have a noun phrase, and so forth. And if, you could, if you're allowed to keep doing that, then you can end up with an infinite number of sentences. Well, even this might not work. There's this language called piraha, uh, which is spoken in Brazil, and it might not actually have recursion. Um, still, this is a more promising avenue, and it's something to do with the fact that it's more mathematical. It has less to do with, like, oh, these specific symbols occur. I mean, what is even a symbol inside your brain? And I don't know, there's lots of tricky things. So this kind of approach might be more fruitful. So, for example, you know, might not want to say all languages have recursion, but you could say all languages have the kinds of grammar that can have recursion, and maybe paraha just accidentally doesn't happen to have any. So what do I mean by a kind of grammar? Well, today I'm going to mean basically this. This is the Chomsky hierarchy, um, and it is um, a hierarchy of characterizations of language, of languages, language classes. And um, where the, the regular languages are, um, are, is, are, are contained inside the context-free languages and so forth. Recursively enumerable, that means anything you could do that you could describe with any kind of a computer as long as it has infinite memory. Um, and uh, um, the languages that we're most interested in are kind of down here, just, uh, just a bit more than context-free, context-free, and uh, way down here in the regular languages. So these are... Um, there are grammars that correspond to these classes, um, and there that's the kind of power that you need to be able to describe these kinds of patterns. That's the idea. I'm going to show you some more specific things about what I mean. Let's start with phonology. So phonology is the sound system of a language, and phonology has rules. Um, so here's, uh, here's an example of a word of Tagalog, which is spoken in the Philippines. Nayon. Now, uh, Nayon, I've written that out here in the International Phonetic Alphabet, if anyone knows how to read that, um, is a great word of Tagalog, it means now, uh, but I can tell you right now this is not a word of English. Even though I don't know all the words of English, I know this isn't a word of English, and you know that this is not a word of Dutch. Why? It's because it violates the rules of English and Dutch phonology. It violates specifically its phonotactics, which is rules about what words can look like, what world words can be made up of. So in this particular case, the problem is that English and Dutch can't have ng at the start of a word. We can have ng with an n, and we can have ng with an m, but we can't have ng with like an ng kind of a sound. This is, a, this is something that speakers know about their language. So you could learn the phonotactic rules of a language, let's say English, um, even from a text. So you could just write down a bunch of words, uh, put them into uh, the International Phonetic Alphabet so that you have one symbol per, uh, per sound, put some symbols at the start and the end that tell you where the words start and end, put some symbols in between the syllables maybe if you're worried about syllables, and then you just make a list of every pair of symbols that occur next to each other. These are called bigrams. You might have heard of those before. And that's the whole story. This gives you what's called a strictly local grammar for English phonotactics. Uh, strictly local, or bigram, or, uh, or n-gram, really, or um, a uh, Markov chain. These are all the same thing. Um, and it's enough. So, this, so for example, let's say we have the word phonology. So this is phonology written out in IPA. This says, phonology, and I stuck a, this, this means it's the beginning of a sentence of a word, and I put dots between the syllables, and this means it's the end of the word, and then I just take out all the pairs that occurred next to each other. And then what I say is, any word, all of whose bigrams look like this, belongs to my language. Not belongs to English, but belongs to the possible words of English. Words that English could, in principle, have if we wanted them. So here's a couple. So, g. Uh, I have to start with the start symbol, so I have to start with F, and F can be followed by schwa, so sh-f, and schwa can be followed by the end of a syllable, and the end of a syllable can be followed by j, and j can be followed by e, and e can end a word, so fuji is okay. So is fololinaji, or um all these, these things, and this is just comes from a single word of English. So you can imagine, that and the emphasis is not a parameter in this? 
not in this. Though. This is this is just this is this is the just the the, uh, the sounds and not think about the sort of um, prosody structure of a word. Yeah. And not things like fudgy can occur, but fudgy cannot occur. That's right. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Uh, you'd, uh, you, in this case, you could say that uh, uh, that uh, that you on top of this, you have to decide where <coughs> the stress goes. So mm. in English, schwas are stressless. So you wouldn't be able to say fudgy, but you could say fudgy. So that's some additional information. This is just what symbols can occur, what basically what sounds can occur next to each other. <coughs> yeah. So how do you deal with the word like uh, apartheid? Like what? Apartheid, because that's an it's a Dutch word, uh, but I think they use it in English now. But I don't think they use that the e i anywhere in English. That's so. a great question. So we um, the what we do is when we borrow words, uh, we find something close enough. So if we borrowed this, whoops, where to go? Uh, this word into English, for some reason we didn't like our word for now, we'd probably say nayon or neon or something like that. And uh, we just take it that way. Yeah, so apartheid in English is tie with like I, not with A. Yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah. Perhaps you're also more likely to borrow a word which resembles what you are allowed to. I think this is word. true. Um, does anybody know any experiments on this? Yeah. No, uh, but it, it's likely true. It's really hard to borrow a word that you can barely even he like, parse when you hear it, right? Yeah. Like sushi is a great English word. It, it, it doesn't violate any of our uh, uh, any of our rules of phonotactics. We so we borrowed that no problem, right? Yeah. Uh, where were we? Right. Okay. So formally, a strictly local language is if you take the set of bigrams, let's call it B. Say those are legal bigrams, and then you say all finite words that only have legal bigrams are in your language. Um, we're going to keep coming back to these symbols. Um, so if you have a finite set of symbols, so in this case it'll be like letters basically, um, that, that's uh, called your alphabet. Uh, sigma star stands for all finite sequences of symbols that come from, from, from sigma. And we'd say that the language of B, I'll write L of B like that, is um, the set of all sequences that start with the start symbol have some finite number of stuff from sigma and end with the end symbol, and all of the things that are next to each other come from the set of bigrams. So a not crazy, but unfortunately also not true hypothesis is that the possible words of any given human language always form a strictly local language. Now this is, this is this definitely a little bit crazy right now because we're only using bigrams. You probably need three or maybe four symbols in a row to really, to really capture things properly. If you do that, you're actually pretty good. You can get a whole bunch of human language phonotactics just by describing them this way. But, um, oh sorry, yes. And it's also really learnable. So our baby who doesn't know spaghetti isn't a hat. It's perhaps a very, very clever baby uh, who knows that she should listen for bigrams in her language. And she's just going to memorize them. Maybe she has to hear them kind of often or something, but she's just going to memorize them whenever she hears them, just like we did when we made our list of symbols, of pairs of symbols. And this is a, this is a learning algorithm. This works. In a finite amount of time, she can learn the infinite number of, a probably infinite number of words that are allowed to occur in her language. So this idea of knowing that you should, this is something we could say is in UG. So the baby is born knowing that at least a whole bunch of what she needs to learn about the phonotactics of her language, she can learn by listening for bigrams. Um, these things do make infinite use of finite means uh, in a slightly different way. So for example, let's say that these are our bigrams where you can start with an A, A's can be next to each other and you can end with an A. Well, that's enough to describe every sequence of A's that you want. All numbers of sequence of A's, and that's an infinite language. The stuttering person. Sorry? The stuttering person. Uh, 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 uh. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. All right. So, in the Chomsky hierarchy, you may be wondering where this falls. It falls way, way, way down at the bottom. Um, so these, uh, these languages are, um, you don't require very much power at all to explain them. You can use extremely powerful grammars if you want to explain them, but you can also use extremely weak grammars to explain them. So way down here is the subregular hierarchy, which looks like this. 
Um, and see there's regular at the top? That's the blue circle? Yeah. Uh, and this is what we just did. Found at the very bottom. Alright, but this isn't enough. So you may be familiar with the Irma Gerd girl. Um, so this is another meme I found the other day. So uh, Europe, Europe, which is I think Californian, has a rhotic vowel harmony. What it means is that if you have a word with a, a, or o in it, and then it gets a suffix or prefix or something which has er in it, that's how this little funny thing is, is pronounced, um, then they all turn into er, like this. This is the example from the meme. So this is a word for three, nux. Uh, and this is a suffix which turns it into a, th a word three that you're only allowed to use for animals. Uh, and it's pronounced er, er, And if you put it together to make a word three that's just for animals, you get nerx, er, er, not nox, er, er. So even though this thing has an A in it, it actually ends up being pronounced with an er. So we can't explain this with bigrams. And we don't even know quite how far apart our vowels are going to end up being, so we don't really want to just say a big number like k grams, you know. Um, what we really want to do is talk about the vowels. So let's just look at the vowels. If we do this, we, we, we just basically project up our vowels and we say, look, when you only look at the vowels, then these bigrams are, in this case I said the Ill illegal ones because that's shorter to write, it's equivalent. So I say don't, don't make any of these things next to each other if you're only considering the vowels. So this is bad, but if we changed our a ah to an er, then we're happy none of these are pairs from here. So this is similar to what we already saw, but it adds a tier, like for vowels for example. Um, so Heinz hypothesizes that this is enough for all the phonotactics of all human language. So not including the stress stuff that, uh, that uh, we were asking about, but, uh, but just what, what sounds are allowed to occur in words, uh, in what order. Um, so that is one, contains the strictly local languages, because you can imagine it's just one tier, um, but, uh, but adds on uh, adds on this ability to project a tier. So this puts all, if this is true, that puts all of human language phonotactics um, with very uh, weak, very um, simple grammars, very non-powerful grammars. Uh, these are also learnable. All right, so can we do the same thing with syntax? Can we use subregular grammars to describe human language syntax? That is, is human language syntax subregular? Well, let's take these two sentences and pull out all their bigrams. So I put the start and end symbols on the sentences and pulled out all the bigrams of words this time. And let's take a look at this sequence here. Is human language syntax subregular grammars to describe human syntax subregular? Sounds a bit like Siri, doesn't it? Um, so what can we do? <laughs> Um, we can just look, we can just pass uh, a little window through the sentence and look and see what we find. So this is our first bigram, we can go check in our list, and there is, uh, is human, yeah, uh -huh. human language, yeah, uh-huh, language, yeah, there it is, etc., etc. We just pass through the whole thing, we pass a window over the sentence, and we check each one against our list of legal bigrams, and they're all there. So, this... I should say first. Um, we, I gave you two, uh, two sentences of English. I gave you a new sequence uh, generated by those bigrams, and it's definitely not a sentence of English. And so we have proven by counterexample that English is definitely not strictly local on the syntactic level. It's also not tier wise strictly local or regular, just in case you're wondering. So, what is it? So, the thing about syntax is it seems to have a sort of a structure to it. I think words belong to, together to the exclusion of other words in a sentence, like human language, that goes together in the sentence, right? That's just like, that makes the subject and the rest of it makes the predicate, that kind of thing. That seems to be a true thing about language. So if I told you, hey, this, 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 uh, this sentence has this structure, the whole thing is an S, uh, a sentence, the human plus language forms a noun phrase, these guys together form a verb phrase, this is an adjective, that kind of a thing. 
Um, and I said, you know, just like we had a set of uh, bigrams for um, for uh, words, for symbols and words, what if we had a set of bigrams for trees? So a bigram and a tree means something different. It means that you can put a have also a window somewhere, and the top thing is the first thing in the bigram, and anything underneath it that's just one step underneath it is all the second things in the bigram. So you can write a list, if I gave you a list of bigrams, and this is just a notation for tree bigrams, um, and I go through my, by, I put, sit past my window through the tree, and I check to make sure that all of my tree bigrams belong to my list of tree bigrams. So there's S is made up of NPVP, N is, MP is made up of two Ns, N is made up of human, etc., etc. VP is ox and AP, and so forth. And we can check, and if I say, look, this is all the uh, tree bigrams that are allowed, then I can say, yes, this tree belongs to my strictly local tree language. So strictly local tree language is a set of tree bigrams. And there's a set of start symbols and terminal symbols, which I'll, I'll show you the point of them in a sec. Start symbols are basically just things like this S we saw at the top of the tree, and the terminal symbols are just the, the words that belong to the language. The tree language of this grammar is just the set of all trees whose tree bigrams belong to our set of bigrams, and whose root is an S, the root is the thing at the top of the tree, and whose leaves are in sigma, those are the things at the bottom of the tree. And so remember, this was our one for strings. We said these guys have to be in B, so that's the same as this. And we also said it had to start with a, with the start symbol, so that's this bit here. The starting with the start symbol, and we had to end with an end symbol, and that's the bit where we say the leaves have to be from sigma. So it's really the same thing, just for trees. Now, we're almost there. Trees have a string yield, which just means you read off the leaves in order. So the string yield of this tree is human language isn't subregular. So in addition to talking about the tree language of a grammar, this set of bigrams for trees, we can also talk about the string language of this same grammar, which is just the yield of all the trees that are in the tree language of the grammar. So for example, in our tiny little grammar, we have exactly two trees in our tree language. Uh, the one that you already saw, and the one where we switch language and human. That's it. These things have their string yields, which forms the string language of the grammar. Human language isn't subregular, and language human isn't subregular. This is definitely isn't English, is it? Um, <clears throat> now this is usually called a context-free grammar. Context-free is one of our levels in the Chomsky hierarchy. So these, even though our trees are subregular, our trees are strictly local, the power of these trees to create these string yields is much more powerful. So as soon as we add, we add the tree level to these things, suddenly we can create these very, we have a lot of power to create lots of new types of languages that we didn't have the power to create before. Can I ask about the previous slide? Yeah. So I, I agree, of course, that language human is not something that we usually use. Mm -hmm. but, but that partly, to me, feels like a cultural thing. I mean, there could be something like a language human and a mathematical human in, in our... Good point. And, and then it would be perfect. It's actually well totally... Uh, it almost. Well, why, so is human not an why is human not an well, adjective? It would be a proper language. name then. Maybe human. it's an adjective. <laughs> Surely it's an adjective. <laughs> nouns can modify nouns. In Dutch, this would all be one word, right? Yeah. It would make a compound <laughs> of nouns, probably. Um, so the, uh, it's almost true, but uh, you, um, because this is the complex, this is, this is something that we haven't captured at all here. Language is a mass noun, which means it doesn't need a determiner, it doesn't need a yeah. the or whatever. But human is not, and it does, so that's why it doesn't, doesn't count. Otherwise, the, there was nothing wrong with uh, language modifying human the, way, the same way that human modifies language. Right. Yeah, yeah, so and this language, this grammar here doesn't capture that fact at all. So a sentence like, a language human isn't subregular should be a sentence. That's right. Yeah, exactly. Or if it's a proper noun, like a language human. Yes. <laughs> yes. I am language human. You're not subregular. Like, no. Yes. Right, so this 
we saw was a finite language, right? But all you need to do is add, is add recursion, and it becomes infinite. So we can have this new rule that says that noun phrases can be modified by adjective phrases. And then we set puts noun phrase inside noun phrases, like that, like we saw at the beginning. And now we can let subregular human language is it subregular. Well, that's not true, but it's a perfectly good sentence. <laughs> And we can just keep adding subregular onto this because we're silly and you can go on forever. Okay, great. So our, language, our human language is context free. Uh, they're showing you all this lovely stuff. Uh, no, actually they're not. But um, this, is, this is pretty good. So it's a little bit like when we saw earlier that uh, Strictly Local was actually pretty good for a lot of human language phonotactics. You can capture a whole bunch of true things about human language just with a context free grammar. Um, just with these strictly local tree languages and the string yields. Um, gives you, it seems to be about right for describing what words go together to the exclusion of other words, which are called constituents. Um, but it's not quite enough. You need more power. Context-free isn't enough power. Um, so this is something you, um, I'm not going to fully explain here, but this is a different use of a tree. This is a derivation tree, which describes uh, how a language can be built using operations called merge and move. And this has the power um, to uh, move pieces of your sentence around in, in, the, in, the, in the string or in the tree. And that seems to be enough. Um, so Thomas Graff has a hypothesis that these derivation trees are tier-wise strictly local in the same way that, those, that the strings were. So you just, you have some specific way that you have defined of ignoring parts of the tree at once and just asking what their bigrams are like, what their tree bigrams are like. So the blue part here is a, is a tier, and this tier is good, according to the list of good bigrams. And the red stuff here um, make, is, is this tier, and this tier is bad, according to the list of good bigrams. Um, so this is bad, and it's actually supposed to derive what, who, Bill gave to. That's not good. Yeah, and we can't do that in English. And, uh, and this is an explanation of why the, 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 the uh, derivation tree um, should be, t is a tier-wise strictly local tree language, is the idea. So... Could you, could you explain a little better what is a derivation tree? A derivation tree is a tree which describes the process by which something is made. So in this particular case, um, the, uh, um, well, let's just, let's look at this moment, for example. At this, at this node here, we have built something which is just pronounced gave. And at this juncture here, we've produced something which is just pronounced to. And when we put them together with this operation merge, I don't, I'm not going to tell you why that's the case, but when we, when we put those two things together with this operation merge, we put gave next to two and we get gave to. And that's what we'll have built at this juncture. Um, so that's, that's what it means to have a derivation tree. So it's a tree that describes this process. And each of these things is an operation on tuples of strings. <coughs> finite tuples of strings. This is called a minimalist grammar. Um, right. So minimalist grammars, which, which are hypothesized, well, which, which have a normal form, which is tier wise strictly local. Um, so these are supra context free. Slightly. So previously we just had this wall that was yellow here and I just added this orange thing in between context free and context sensitive. Um, so Joshi in the 80s noticed that uh, human language is, we, we already knew that it was more than context free, but he said, you know, I think it's just a little bit more than context free and he characterized how little bit more we needed. Um, and that's what he called that the mildly context sensitive class of languages. These guys belong to that class, these, uh, these minimalist grammars. Um, right, so the hypothesis, the two hypotheses together then, are that human language phonotactics can be described with a tier-wise strictly local language, a grammar, on the strings, and human language syntax can be described with a tier-wise strictly local language uh, on the derivation trees which are kind of like the trees that we've already seen. So in one case you look at the string, in the other case you step up some power and look at the trees, 
and, uh, and, and then you basically have the same thing. So, universal grammar. <coughs> Perhaps you could say that what the baby knows is that her grammar is going to be, both of her grammars that she's looking for, are going to be tier-wise strictly local. And because she already knows this, this gives this 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 tells her that this this constrains the the space of hypotheses. This constrains what she can what she can worry about, and it it, it can help her learn the languages. And that's it. I think we have. Uh, I'm not sure what time did I start. Neither do I. Excellent. Okay, I think we have at least two minutes for questions. <laughs> <laughs>